Thank you, everyone, for joining us today here. It is really a great honor for me to be here to participate in the Innovation and Development Week, and I'm thankful to all the work that the Development Economic Center has put together to all these activities here um, in celebration of the inauguration of the Development Innovation Lab. So one of the hallmarks of the University of Chicago is that our faculty contribute to some of the world's greatest advances and discoveries through field-defining research. And today's lecture will be given by one of those field-defining scholars, Michael Kramer, University of Professor in Economics, the Harris School for Public Policy and the College, Director of Development Innovation Lab and Faculty Director of the Development Economic Center. Michael has many other uh, honors, um, including being the recipient of the 2019 Nobel Prize um, in economics. So if I may just look back a little bit on the trajectory of Michael, it seems to me that a substantive portion of his pathway to generating field-defining research was the transformative education he received at a high school in rural Kenya. Now, before he embarked on his graduate studies, Michael actually moved to teach in a high school. And while his lesson, I'm sure, were very helpful to the students, it was really that his students and friends in the community of Kakamea that fundamentally shifted the career path of the budding macro theorist. Michael's volunteers work in Western Kenya taught him the importance of being on the ground when it came to problem solving and helped carve the path for the first randomized evaluation in development economics, which would eventually lead to Michael's sharing the Nobel Prize in 2019 for his contribution in introducing experimental approach to economics. After finishing his PhD at Harvard, Michael actually returned to Kenya and together with his friends there, began exploring the challenges facing students in local schools. So they set out to work, implementing Michael's newfound skills to help his adopted community by providing vigorous evidence of the benefits of providing free textbook to struggling students. And to do so, they actually set up one of the first randomized controlled trials in development economics. But instead of getting the results of the evidence that they're looking for, namely that providing books to the struggling student would actually enhance the um, ability to achieve higher score and therefore allow them to help shift national policies and bringing free books to this population, Michael actually discovered that providing textbook had no effect on the average test scores. So he dug in deeper. Through a rich sense of context, such as the knowledge gained from working with those with an intimate understanding of the realities on the ground and prolonged collaborations with practitioners as well as specialists in other fields, as well as many, many rounds of study and iteration, Michael and his colleagues eventually identified a series of interventions that did and continue to help students. One effective intervention has to do with providing school-administered deworming medication. Michael and his colleagues found the unexpected result that provision of deworming medication improved education outcome, while providing textbook did not. And the findings helped to demonstrate to fellow economists the value of experimental approach. In the years since his first experiment, Michael has been largely influential in shaping the field of development economics specifically and economics more generally. And by pioneer methods to causally identify the effects of policies in the real world, especially by advancing the use of randomized controlled trials, Michael, as his community of collaborators in Kenya and beyond, helped launch what has been called the credibility revolution across social sciences. And in doing so, as the Nobel Committee observed when announcing the prize he received, Michael has considerably improved our ability to fight global poverty. 
The results can be seen in the statistics of welfare improved and life saved in almost every domain which Michael has worked. Being a serial entrepreneur, Michael has founded and co-founded many organizations, including World Teach, which actually supported 7,500 volunteer teachers in low-income countries, Deworm the World, which has administered more than 1.3 billion courses of treatment to children, Precision Development, which provides digital agricultural extension services to more than 5 million smallholder farmers across 10 countries, and USAID's Development Innovation Ventures, where Michael is scientific director, and help advise on setting up French government's Fund for Innovation in Development, which provided $100 million in grant across 47 countries. Michael also conducted research on dispenser for safe water and co-founded Evidence Action, a nonprofit organization directly benefited 4 million people and leading to a 65 million commitment by GiveWell to further scale up the intervention in multiple countries in East Africa. He's also known for the work with his wife and fellow economist, Rachel Glanister, on advanced market commitments, resulting in vaccines for neglected tropical diseases that have benefited more than 150 million children and recently helped supply the COVID-19 vaccine that the entire world is relying on. And as for Kenyan students that Michael and his early collaborators helped with the deworming treatment, a recent paper actually showed that relative to those who did not receive the treatment, these students and their families continue to have a higher level of education and improved welfare more than two decades later. As part of Innovation and Development Week, we are also officially welcoming Michael to the U Chicago community even though it's 18 months later, as this is the first time many people have had the opportunity to meet him in person due to the pandemic. We're also celebrating the inauguration of the new Development Innovation Lab, which Michael is leading. He founded this lab to build on and expand upon the ability to fight global property, poverty. Although the lab is still in its infancy, it has already made a substantial impact in generating knowledge and advancing evidence-based policy in sectors of safe water, education, agriculture, financial services, and vaccine acceptance. Last fall, on his first day uh, in his new role, President Alavasatos asked all of us to reflect on the following questions. What can be done to support and enhance foundational discovery and education at the university? And how can the journey towards a more fully engaged U Chicago best be advanced so that the two can actually reinforce and support each other? The Development Innovation Lab addresses both of these questions in substantive and meaningful ways. So it is with great pleasure and gratitude that I introduce Michael Kramer to inaugurate the Develop an Innovation Lab by sharing with us his reflections on innovation, experimentation, and economics. Michael. Well, thank you very much, Provost Lee. I appreciate that uh, very, very warm and, uh, introduction. Uh, you know, it may have been a little bit over generous at, at times, but I'm not going to complain. <laughs> um, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Ben, uh, uh, for the introduction, for all your work for the uh, for Development Economic Center and Development Innovation Lab. And uh, uh, I think you've um, your your introduction. Um, uh, you know, maybe I don't need to give my talk now because you've already given, covered uh, many of the key points. But I'll I'll I'll, uh, I'll try to um, I'll, I'll try to elaborate a little bit more. So, um, but first, let me say a little bit about the uh, about you know what what um, what uh, what we've just very recently announced, which is the Development Economic Center, as Ben explained, and 
as Ben noted, this is supporting uh, uh, PhD students and faculty, uh, especially junior faculty in development economics throughout the university at Harris, at Booth, and in, uh, in the economics department and beyond. And I, you know, Chicago, I knew this before I came, but I was really reinforced uh, when, I, when I arrived and, and started interacting with colleagues, initially mostly over Zoom and outdoor meetings, but, uh, but now in person uh, more. Um, you know, there's a lot of very exciting work across many different subject areas going on at the university. And the university, uh, Provost Lee, and, and, and the university as a whole has made a tremendous commitment to build on and to extend uh, the strengths of the University of Chicago in this, in this area. So just to mention a few um, you know, of, the, of the different subject areas within development, there are people working on environmental issues, people working on applications of, of uh, behavioral economics to development economics, people working on macroeconomic issues and productivity and economic growth, people working on political economy, people working on economic history. And as you can imagine from that list, there's a wide range of methodological approaches. I'm going to, you know, in any particular talk, I'm going to focus on one thing and, and I'll talk about some work that, I, that I've been involved in. But I think it's very important to know that a great thing about the University of Chicago is you know, across geographies, across subject areas, across methodologies, there's a huge set of resources to, to draw on. And the Development Economic Center is there to support the, the full range of, of development economics. Um, let me just, I'll, I'll put a slide showing, and this is just the tenure track uh, faculty, and hope I, uh, other people aren't omitted, um, but this gives a sense of some of the people who are, who are involved. You know, some of these people work primarily on development economics, some people uh, just work partially on that and also work in other fields. But it's a very, uh, it's obviously a very impressive list. And I'll note that it's a, it's a growing list and that several of the people who, who've joined have just come in the past, uh, in the past couple of years. Okay. Um, okay, so let me turn, um, um, let me, let me turn, you know, sorry, before I turn into the, the main, uh, the main theme of the talk, um, let me also say a little bit about the Development Innovation Lab. Um, and you know, ben, ben gave the outline. Um, um, so, well, I'll tell you what, why don't I, why don't, since Ben covered a lot of this, I'm going to come, I'll come back to it in the, in the very conclusion and relate it to the rest of the talk. Um, I have too many slides, so I'm very grateful to both of you for anything that you've, uh, you've, you've, you've uh, allowed me to skip. Okay, so, um, um, so, what I'd like to talk about today is innovation, and um, I'll first talk about uh, a particular methodological approach, uh, the experimental method, um, and how it can be a tool for innovation. I also think it can be a very important tool for uh, generating fundamental understanding as well, and you know, maybe I'll touch on that, and you know, would love to, you know, um, could talk more about, for example, the textbook example you mentioned. You know, we think textbooks uh, probably, prob it's nothing inherent about, we think textbooks are very important, yet they didn't work in this context. I think that was, in some ways, just looking at a very practical, specific problem. But I feel that that also generated some more fundamental scientific understanding of the of, of the nature of education in, in many low and middle income countries. So I won't focus on those issues today, but I'm happy to come to it in Q&A or, or discuss another time. Rather, I'll focus on the specific issue of, of innovation. Okay. And then, um, um, well, our first, first part of the talk will be about methods, a uh, particular method and how that can be a tool for innovation. The second part of the talk, we'll try to, and I'll give some examples, um, um, but the second part of the talk, we'll try to talk about ways of systematically supporting innovation and some lessons about, you know, is that a good investment? 
how can that be structured uh, to be successful? So this will re relate, I think, in some ways to uh, the book that John List just br brought out on scaling. Okay, so starting with the experimental method. Um, so you know, what is the experimental method? Well, it's, it's you know, very simple. I think everybody in this room is probably familiar with it in the context of, of medical trials. If you want to understand, if you just look at do people who go to the doctor, go to hospitals, uh, do they get healthier? Well, if you just look on average, people who go to hospitals or people who get serious procedures done, they're probably less healthy afterwards than people who never went to the hospital in the first place. But of course, you know, that's, uh, that doesn't mean the hospital wasn't effective. Uh, there's, there, there'll be reasons why that correlation doesn't indicate causal impact. And so medical researchers uh, developed the idea of using randomized trials and that's had a huge influence in medicine. And you know, what colleagues and, and, and I've been involved in in economics in some ways is adapting that approach uh, to, to development economics. I think the, the devil is in the details of that, and that turned out to be um, to have all sorts of implications beyond what we initially uh, thought about. So let me be a little bit more, more specific. So, you know, when I first got involved in this, it was very much for the, for the, to try to get a causal impact and, and separate um, causal impact from, from other factors um, that might confound measurement of, of causal impact. Um, the, um, the, um, and I think that, you know, that is a very important advantage of the experimental method. Um, but, um, and, many policies which turn out to have very different effects when they're measured, when the impact is measured experimentally than when different statistical approaches are used to try to tease out causal impact from, 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 uh, from selection or from other confounding factors. Um, but I think, um, as, as Provost Lee indicated, I think a lot, for me at least, a lot of the power of this approach comes, came not from that, but from uh, other aspects of the approach that I think um, have had to account for a lot of its influence. So first, um, you know, when you're involved in a, in a randomized trial, that provides the researcher with a much richer sense of context than they might get if they were just looking at uh, a data that somebody else had collected. Uh, does it? You don't need to do do an experiment to get that sense of context. And there's some you know, wonderful researchers who who spend a lot of time in the field without doing uh, using the experimental method. But I think this um, this does sort of force the researcher to get involved in that because they have to spend time piloting things, developing questionnaires, piloting the questionnaires, talking to, if it's an agriculture study, talking to farmers, if it's an education study, talking to students, talking to teachers. Um, and that, that brings in many aspects of the problem that the researchers might have neglected at first. And again, I'll sort of tease this uh, education idea, you know, why, it was that sense of context that I think uh, helped us move beyond the negative result that we didn't see an increase in average test scores to get uh, in the education example that the provost Lee discussed to try to understand what might develop a hypothesis for what might be going on, which we could then uh, together uh, with with the profession as a whole we could uh, we could we could try to test and and see if that indeed was the right hypothesis. Okay. Let me. A third aspect of, right, of the experimental approach is that it often focuses on specific practical problems. Now, you know, one might think that that's the opposite of trying to develop generalizable knowledge, what, what science is trying to do. But I think one advantage of the experimental approach is that you're confronting a specific practical problem. And it's very hard to hide from the results. You know, if you're using various statistical techniques to try to adjust for, um, for a whole host of factors that are hard to capture, you, know, you may be able to and, um, you know, spin a story of why things didn't work and develop some uh, evidence for that. And, and uh, 
remain satisfied with that explanation. The um, if you're if you're working on a practical on a specific practical problem, and you get very clear results and they don't fit your theoretical model, that can push you towards uh, another towards at least looking for another explanation. Okay. Um, a fourth, and that's the sort of the scientific benefit, but I think there's also, I'm going to focus on the benefits of this for innovation. Um, I'll, also, I'll come to that in, in the majority of the talk. Um, a fourth element is that these types of, these people who are using the experimental method, this might initially sound like a limitation of the method, as some of the other features I've identified. You have to spend time in the field, that's time consuming, requires you have to raise money for that, there's also, you know, well, you know, you have to work with practitioners typically. I mean, there are a few ca there are cases where researchers do things on their own, but typically they're working with practitioners and organizations or governments or NGOs or firms, and you develop a lot of insights from those uh, practitioners you're often also working with scientists working in other areas or researchers working in other areas. So if, if this is an a education uh, uh, trial, you're typically working with people, education experts, or in many cases you are. If it's health, there'd be health experts. Um, um, if it's agriculture, there might be um, agronomists, for example. And it's a chance to bring in insights from outside the economics field and I think that can be very valuable. Okay. And fifth, it's iterative. And that means um, it can be iterative in, in many different ways, but if you have a hypothesis for why a particular result came or why something didn't work, like textbooks, um, then you can potentially test that hypothesis. And you can do so pretty rapidly. You don't have to wait for the next naturally occurring experiment to, to arise. Um, you know, obviously, natural experiments are another very powerful technique in economics, which is and uh, that you know as as uh, as appropriately recognized through the most recent uh, Nobel Prize. Um, but you sometimes have to wait for those to occur. Although with sufficient creativity, you can you can often find them. Now, I think all of these features um, help contribute to first to science, and I'm happy to elaborate on that later. Um, well, let me say a little bit about this particular case of education since it's come up in textbooks. You know, the, the, in, that, in that case, I was both disappointed by these results and puzzled by them. You know, um, and then I thought about the time that I'd spent in the field, partly uh, as part of the research study, partly from being a, a secondary school teacher, and realized that, or remembered, that, you know, Kids in these environments have face a very difficult situation. There, you know, there's a lot of disease, malaria, worms have been mentioned. There's a lot of HIV. These kids were dealing with huge, you know, they, they, their parents were often sick with HIV. They might have had to take care of their siblings. They might have had to bring in money for the, for the school. Their teachers are, were, were often absent. Um, it's very easy to fall behind. But the curriculum, is set at a fairly, you know, at an international standard. And kids, by the way, are also learning in their third language. Now they'll, they'll have the language they speak at home, then Swahili will be their second language, English will be the third language. But the education system of Kenya, these were regular you know, government schools, but government schools, once you get past the first few grades, those are taught in English. So you're learning in your third language. It's very easy to slip behind the curriculum for a variety of the historical reasons and political economy reasons within, within not just Kenya, but many uh, low and middle income countries, curricula are often taught, are often set to standards that might be very appropriate for the kids of the uh, people in the education ministry who are trying to, whose kids will have to face international competition and will be you know, trying to uh, advance in the world. But that means that in a poor rural area, kids may fall behind. And there's not a lot of flexibility uh, to bring people, uh, to, to bring those kids back up to, uh, to, the, to where the curriculum is. So we, we got a bit of a test of this 
by saying, let's look at the kids who are doing particularly well in, um, at the beginning of the study. And for those, we saw that there were gains from the textbooks, but the rest of the kids weren't in a position to benefit from this. And then that led to other research, um, primarily led by, by others, although played a, a role in it, um, which tested various approaches for helping provide education to help those kids catch up. So a lot of work on remedial education, works on other techniques that led to a set of approaches called teaching at the right level, which have now had tremendous, uh, tremendous impact around the world. So that's an example of how a negative result led to iteration, um, partly by thinking about the particular context. Um, and that eventually, uh, there was a scientific insight there uh, about the nature of education systems, but there was also uh, something that ultimately proved useful for policy. But let me focus, uh, let me return to the, the theme uh, that I'd intended, which is uh, talking about innovation. By the way, I don't see a clock, so feel free to signal, signal me um, um, when, I, uh, when I should speed up. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think all of these features of the experimental method make it quite well suited as a tool for innovation. And if you think about it, the experimental method is very much like A-B testing. And obviously, tech companies are doing A-B testing all the time. Um, and so you know, often these things are, this approach was known initially as randomized evaluations. And the problem with the word evaluation is it suggests something at the end of the process to sort of mark up, were you successful or were you a, was this program a failure? But I would think of them much more like A-B testing, things that you're supposed to learn from that come at the, as part of the, uh, 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 as one part, but a part of the process of innovation. So let me tell an example that focuses on that, uh, one which uh, previously uh, I mentioned a bit, but I'll add a step to this story. Um, one issue that I've worked on with, uh, with co-authors is the uh, issue of unsafe water. So, um, you know, diarrheal disease is often caused by contaminated water is a major cause of child death in low-income countries. And we're involved in testing a program run by a small nonprofit organization, um, which involved protecting a spring. And that's, I haven't, there's not a picture of an unprotected spring here, but an unprotected spring, there's basically a hole in the ground, water's bubbling up, there's a lot of those in this area. Um, and, you know, runoff can come from the area in, including animal waste, you know, little kids collect water and scoops them out, their hand gets in the water, can easily, easily get contaminated. Uh, um, and a protected spring, and you see an example here, the, the eye of the spring is, a pipe is put down there, it's encased in concrete, and then the water comes out and it's much cleaner. And in fact, you know, at first, our, we, we, you know, we were quite encouraged by this. We saw 74%, I believe, uh, no, 66% uh, reduction in, uh, in fecal contamination, indicator of fecal contamination, E. coli counts, um, and the quality of the, in, in the, at the springs. So the spring water quality was much better. But then if you, we, well, we also tested water in people's households, and there, the reduction was, there's still a reduction, but it was much smaller, only about a quarter. And one issue is that the water gets recontaminated in, perhaps in transport, but also definitely in storage. Because people keep a big container of water, a big uh, pottery container of water, it keeps the water cool. But if you're getting some water, you, know, you pick up a, a cup or a mug, you dip your hand in there, your hand gets in the water. And you know that the water can get contaminated, particularly if you're a three-year-old um, and and uh, you know, are not uh, practicing the same levels of hygiene as adults would, um, or a two-year-old. Um, so this is um, so. You know, what's a potential solution? Well, one solution that is is has been introduced, but has pretty low usage rates in the area, is treating water with with dilute chlorine solution. Um, obviously, most of the water that we drink in the United States is, is treated with chlorine. Um, but on a, on a farm in a rural area, there's no pipes uh, bringing in uh, municipally chlorinated water in Kenya. 
Um, so small bottles of dilute chlorine solution are sold to households, and they, they're, you know, 30 cents for a month's supply. That might sound cheap. It's not necessarily so cheap if, you ha if, you're, if your income's very low and you face many needs, as many of these households do. And usage rates are, are pretty low. But if you do use it, that keeps the water safe for, it kills the germs there, and some chlorine remains, and it keeps the water safe for um, you know, one to three days. Um, now, but the, the issue was usage rates. And there we took insights from behavioral economics. So in this case, you're drawing on theories from psychology, from economics, and tried to design an approach to, to, uh, to address this. And this is a, 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 a dispenser of that solution. So take that same chlorine solution. By the way, when I said 30 cents per month supply, you know, most of that is the cost of the packaging, distribution, et cetera. The chlorine itself is, is you know, very cheap. Um, so there's a container full of, of the dilute chlorine solution. Um, when households turn the handle, um, it releases enough uh, to treat a 20-liter container, this, which is the typical container people use to, to collect water and bring it home. Um, and then as they walk home, there's some agitation, some time, and that allows time for the water to be disinfected. But what were the, you know, why, why did I reference uh, behavioral economics? Well, a few things. First, you know, the dispensers are uh, designed to be salient. It's big, blue. It provides a, a bit of a visual cue. Um, it was incorporated into something that people were doing each day, water collection, um, so that that might have facilitated habit formation around this. It was visible to others. So if you had a question, you could see the person ahead of you in, uh, collecting water, and you, could, and you could ask them about it, and people could also see whether you were using it, and that might facilitate social norm uh, formation. And perhaps most critically, it was provided for free because research, not just in Kenya, but research around the world has shown that adoption of, behavior, of preventive health behaviors is very sensitive to small factors that either make this a default or put a small barrier in the way. And even a small barrier can lead to big reductions in, in take up. And, uh, and certainly that's the case for pricing in, in low income environments. Um, so the dispenser increased water treatment fourfold over the initial uh, low rate. So to about a point where about half the people treated their water. That increase was sustained over time when we tested it several years later. Um, and it was then scaled up to some extent by an, a nonprofit organization, which uh, this is uh, one area where I, I want to claim a little bit less credit. I didn't, uh, evidence action, I didn't uh, found them, but I was involved in developing the dispenser, um, which they then later uh, took on. Um, they, um, they provide, um, they, they currently provide water, uh, water treatment solution for about 2 million people every day across uh, three countries in East Africa. Now, there was lots of, I'm skipping over lots of steps. There was lots of iteration on the dispenser itself. You know, the first model, that handle is made of plastic. Well, why does chlorine kill germs? It reacts with everything. I, mean, I don't know much chemistry, but this is what I'm told. Uh, I'll look over in that direction. Um, um, well, that includes reacting with a particular type of plastic. It wasn't, it wasn't the right kind of plastic. So, you know, that was not a very good uh, solution. It required working with engineers to develop something, uh, something better. Um, the, um, the, and with artisans. Um, the, but you know, there are also innovations in how do you keep these resupplied and how do you, how do you finance them. There, there was uh, well, testing of those and then uh, optimization of those. Now, um, a, a question, however, so um, you know, eventually a workable system was developed, but a question is what's the impact on, on does this actually reduce mortality? That's very hard to get at because Mortality, thankfully, is a rare event. You need a huge, a huge sample size to, to get at that. And this is something that I've um, been involved in through the, through, through the Development Innovation Lab here at Chicago. So while the individual studies of water treatment are usually not sufficiently large to pick up effects on mortality, 
just on diarrhea, which is much more common. We were able to, com to get to follow up on 15 different studies of this type, contact the authors and see if they had any data on mortality. And when you combine these, these studies, we find a 30% reduction in the odds of child mortality from water treatment. This is not all through this particular approach. Now, that, you know, that proved, together with the experience of, of the NGO having done this for, for years and with several million people, that led, uh, uh, um, led GiveWell to um, announce um, 60, I think this technically might be, I, they may have recommended a grant that was the, that's made by others, but basically $65 million uh, will, will go to scale up this approach to reach more people in a sustained way in, in East Africa. Um, that was just announced a few weeks ago. So now, I don't want to suggest this is the end of the process. You know, I mentioned that only that that uh, that fifty percent of people were reached. Well, it'd be great if more people could be reached. It'd be great if there, you know, it's worth exploring other approaches. This this will work in certain environments, not every environment. So we're continuing to do research on this issue, and I hope that we will we will um, will be able to uh, can find uh, develop other approaches and measure their impact uh, going forward. Okay, so this, this is an example of you know, a particular innovation that seems to have scaled up. Um, but, you know, that's one example. And it's obviously possible to find anecdotes of success, but, you know, there are, that leaves a lot of questions open. Uh, um, you know, there are also lots of failures. You, know, you heard about some of them. There are many more. Um, there, there are cases where the research succeeds and gets a result, and maybe even a positive result, but things don't scale, as brought out you know, uh, in John List's book, which I mentioned. You know, there's work that, um, the pro it isn't just about getting a result. A lot of work needs to be done if you're innovating, even before you should do a randomized trial. You don't need a randomized trial to say that the chlorine is, is damaging the plastic. Um, there's a lot of work that has to be done afterwards. Uh, working with partners, adjusting the model. So is there a way to systematize this and to move from you know, individual one-off uh, examples of success to something that can be, can be implemented more broadly? So I'd like to discuss an approach of what I'll call tiered evidence-based social innovation funds uh, to do this type of work. So, you know, just as, as background, um, there have been many recent initiatives to promote innovation and development. So one type is just funding scientific research and development. And, you know, in, in, um, in you know, one organization that's associated with that, with that is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, supporting all types of health research, agricultural research to develop new seeds. Um, and that you know, health and agriculture problems that particularly affect the developing world. A second type of work is social science research, you know, for example, of the type that I just outlined. Um, a third type is, and World Bank, among others, has supported that work. A third type is impact investing social entrepreneurship. So if you think about the Omidyar Network or the Skoll Foundation, they support a lot of social entrepreneurs with ideas, business ideas, uh, that are designed to be uh, sustainable, financially sustainable, but also to generate social impact. Now, the first type, scientific research, there's many studies examining this, and many find, typically the finding is, very, very high rates of social return. That society as a whole generate benefits hugely, with a 55% return per year uh, on, on investments in agricultural research, for example. But the latter two are much less studied. Now, um, we, we tried to get at, that, at measuring this return, or getting some sense of the return, using data from USAID's Development Innovation Ventures Program. So this was a, a program, and I'll say a little bit more about it, um, that funds innovation in, uh, using multiple different approaches. And 
we, we wanted to first ask, is this a good investment? You know, you can find positive anecdotes, but you can find many, many anecdotes of failure as well. So, you know, there are obviously many pressing immediately, immediate needs, as, as you know, the motivating, uh, you know, Ben reminded us of uh, in his introduction yesterday. Um, you know, there are people who are hungry right now, and they don't need research, they need food. Um, so, um, you know, where should, you know, is this something we should be putting money into? Second, um, I'm not talking about universities where, where the research is a mission, but where, you know, philanthropists and, uh, and government should be putting money into. Second question is which innovations scale? If you have some, if you could predict that at all, then maybe you could do a much, you could generate much more impact for whatever spending is going in. So we looked at those questions and then the results of that um, gener suggested some interesting hypotheses and to account for the results and to help answer a question that if I think about the University of Chicago economics tradition, you know, Milton Friedman was a big skeptic of, of uh, the idea that business, you know, he said the business of, of business is business. Um, that we, he was a skeptic of the idea that we should be trying to achieve social missions with business at the same time and thought, no, you know, we can, to, if individuals want to take the profits they earn and donate that, that's great, but business as a whole shouldn't be trying to do that. So, you know, that's a challenge and we know that economists should, should think about and try to think about, you know, some of the results in light of that, that, uh, that very uh, Chicago approach to thinking about economics. I'll, I'll come to that soon. Before I go into the details of this, I want to disclose that I was a scientific, a, a scientific director of DIV, not just in the past, now, and I'm, I'm involved in a few of these uh, innovations. Um, so I'm not a totally neutral party here. Okay. But, um, so let me give a little bit of background to development innovation ventures. And you know, we're focused, by the way, I'll put this up for two reasons, mainly because I want to uh, explain the the research that we did on this, but if any of you are interested in applying, please you know go online, look at the website, and and think about whether you fit. I'm describing the rules as they were in 2010 because it takes time for innovations to scale. So we looked at our our first you know couple of years of portfolio. So first, um, um, DIV provides open grant funding, um, and by open, it's open across types of innovations. You know, uh, sectors, you know, education, agriculture, whatever people want, uh, geographies, although places where the U.S. government, uh, um, USAID is involved, so no Iran or Cuba, um, for example. Um, um, and importantly, cross-scaling approaches. You know, often there are different funders for things that are intended to scale commercially, and for things that are intended to scale through governments and but uh, or through philanthropy, but we support both. We all have a very broad definition of innovation, not just new gadgets, but also you know new business models, new policy approaches. So we're very open on the one hand. So then, you know, how do you put any discipline on this at all? Well, we put discipline on this through a tiered approach to to uh, to grant making. So there's an initial stage of piloting. That was a $100,000 threshold when we started. But then to achieve larger, to get larger amounts of money, the innovators have to, develop, have to demonstrate some, uh, have to get through, have to undertake a, a pretty rigorous test. Now the nature of that test differs. If it's gonna scale commercially, that could be just, are they, are they covering their costs? Are they bringing enough revenue to do that? If it's a, if they're planning to scale um, through public support, then we ask them to get rigorous evidence of causal impact. Not necessarily through an RCT, but that's the, the, uh, the, uh, the typical approach to a randomized controlled trial. Um, and then the third stage is funding to help transition from the results of an RCT to, to move towards scale. Okay. Um, so let me address the first question. Is this a good investment? Well, for an economist, a natural way to phrase this is, do the benefits of this exceed the cost? 
The benefits are the number of people reached times the net benefits per person. We only include the share of benefits corresponding to the share of the investment, because sometimes there are multiple funders. We don't want to double count. That obviously does not answer the question of would this have scaled had we not been funding it. Um, the, um, you know, I should note, there are huge difficulties estimating the benefits. Um, you know, sometimes there are conceptual issues. Some of these were improving the accuracy of vote counts and reducing fraud in counting votes. How do you put a dollar value on that? We didn't even try. Um, there, there are data limitations. So sometimes conceptually, you know what you would want to measure, but we just don't have the data to measure it. Um, it takes time for innovations to scale. Um, we only have 10 years. So how are we able to make any, any progress at all? Well, what we did was we took advantage of something about the nature of innovation, which is there's a very skewed distribution of the impact of innovation. Um, so this shows you know, one indicator, the number of beneficiaries. And you can see, for the majority of innovations, they reach less than a million people, um, you know, often far, far less than a million people. But nine of these 41, which I think is you know, uh, actually a remarkably good rate, this is a, a tough sector to work, um, reached more than a million people. Now, we weren't able to quantify the benefits for all of them, but for the ones in red, we could make at least a rough stab at quantifying the benefits. So we didn't try to estimate uh, the, the benefit cost ratio. We don't have the data to do that. But what we could do is create a lower bound uh, on this, on, on the benefits. So if we just take the subset in red, we didn't even try for the ones down below, and you know, we tried for the, the ones that went over a million dollars, but we often didn't have the data or didn't even have the conceptual tools. So there are five that we could, we could make this estimate. So if we just take the benefits of that subset, and then we t set it against the cost of the total portfolio, then we have a lower bound on the benefit cost ratio, or to put it non-mathematically, oh, thanks, a very conservative uh, estimate. And if that's positive, it suggests this is a good investment. Okay, I'm going to have to speed up a little bit. Here's an example. This is uh, uh, developed by James Habirimana and Billy Jack, two, two Georgetown researchers. Um, this was, for those of you who have spent time in, in developing countries, uh, many of them, not all, there are many buses that drive like crazy, lots of traffic accidents. They tried an approach of just putting a sticker up in the minibus to tell the passengers, hey, speak up if, if, the, if the driver's not driving safely. Somewhat crazy idea. I did not think this would work. But that's the point. Uh, uh, they actually had some, um, they had some evidence suggesting it, it would work. They'd done a small RCT beforehand. And they found, and they published these results in the Presidium of National Academy of Sciences, you know, a 20, um, hey, a 25% reduction in road accidents using insurance company data. They then went to the insurance companies, the biggest insurance company in Kenya said, yes, we'll make this a condition of coverage. The government said, we'll require this when you install, when you get your annual license. Um, we estimate $2.6 million in net benefits from this. That in, in, involves some assumptions about the value of statistical life that are are philosophically fraught, but fairly standard in health economics. Um, the, uh, I don't mean to dis dismiss the philosophical issues there um, uh, quite so cavalierly, but, um, but I'm running out of time. Uh, <laughs> discounted benefits of, so we take these five projects and the, the total, um, total cost of, the, sorry, the cost of the full portfolio, all 43 projects, $16 million. The net discounted benefits of five investments, just these five, $280 million. So that means a 17 to 1 benefit cost ratio. Obviously, a bunch of assumptions go on that number, but clearly this, the discounted benefits greatly exceed the cost. So then, oh, so let me ask a, a second question, which is, what are the correlates of which ones scale? So one Thing that many people in the field believe, and here's something where you know, I was surprised by the results, was that pilots, very few of them scale. And indeed, when we look at the, you know, a lower fraction of pilots scaled than of, of things that made it to the, the final stage. Um, very small samples here, obviously. 
But then when we look at this uh, using a somewhat different approach, if we look at the number of people reached per dollar spent, we got very different results, suggesting that some of these pilot investments are actually, from a social point of view, are generating a lot of benefits. Um, I can't quite say that from this slide. This is just the number of people reached. But, uh, um, and I w it's not that we conclude these are better than the later investments, just that we shouldn't conclude that these don't work. Here's some other results. The one which I think I, which I feel like I did anticipate was that things have to be really cheap. If you're trying to scale something up in a poor country, whether you're selling to customers, whether you're selling to the government, it's got to be cheap. So much higher rate of scaling if the cost was less than $3 per person. The second one was, and I think this is something that I didn't realize, but perhaps some of my colleagues at the business school would have anticipated, if you're selling a very cheap product to very poor people, you're not making much revenue per item. So if you're trying to sell direct to the consumer, customer acquisition costs are going to be a huge, huge issue. And I should have said, uh, you know, there were a bunch of, you know, uh, social entrepreneurship things, as I said, well, as I did indicate, as well as things, you know, aimed at policy innovations. The third result was, um, um, so the successful ones tended to be selling either to large businesses or to governments, um, um, or to seeking adoption by them, not always selling to them. The third finding was a previous RCT. As I, meant, as I mentioned, Javier Imana and Jack had a, a previous RCT, and that, that was not unusual. They were, but this is very uh, correlated with research. We can't separate out the involvement of a development economics researcher uh, from whether there's a previous RCT. Um, um, but both of these things, the, the combination seems to lead to uh, more scaling, not less. This was, I think, a surprise to many of my colleagues in, in the government and many people in the impact investing world who think of, you know, if you involve researchers, they slow things down. I, I, uh, those of you who work with me will understand why there's some legitimacy to that point of view, but um, um, but um, but it does suggest that you know maybe there's a payoff to this eventually. Okay, um, but what is the source of that payoff? Uh, let me come back to that at the end. Okay, so now let me take on the the Milton Friedman challenge. You know. We know that this was a government program. Governments are subject to lots of regulation. Researchers are slow. You know, governments are slow. Um, they can't, you know, they couldn't hire MBA, you know, booth MBAs to help figure out which in investments to make. You know, why were there such high returns? Well, the hypothesis that generated uh, was that commercial investors are going to leave arbitrage opportunities for social investors on the table when there's certain innovations have low expected private returns, but high social returns. And we can be somewhat systematic about what might cause that. So let me give, you know, Warren Buffett famously says, when he's looking for things to invest in, he wants a moat. By a moat, he means if you're the first move, if he backs a company and they succeed, it's going to be harder. They're not, they're, 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 their profits aren't going to be competed away immediately by a bunch of other firms. That could be a patent, could be other things. Okay? Um, but some industries that exist, some industries that doesn't. Well, if you're a private investor, you want that moat. If you're a social investor, you don't particularly want that moat. Maybe you don't want that moat because you want lots of, if people are developing solar lights that can be bought up by, by rural people who don't have access to electricity, and then a bunch of competing firms enter, well, DIV is thrilled. Um, um, and another area is imagine you're producing an innovation that has very few customers. You know, this road safety sticker, how much money are you going to make from that road safety sticker? Either the government's going to adopt it or the big insurance companies. They're not going to pay you a lot. They could do it. There's no moat. They could make their own sticker. And um, anyway, they have all the bargaining power. Um, so not a lot of private returns, but there might well be high social returns. Okay? Um, or if the product itself generates uh, positive externalities, reducing disease, et cetera. Okay? So that, if you have that story, then you would understand why the private sector isn't investing and why there's a potential opportunity 
for philanthropists of the public sector to invest. And that also has implications for the investment decisions. Let me skip over the next slide. But if you're thinking about investing and you want to be additional to the private sector, not just copy the, you know, the best practices of venture capital, but think about the fact there's a lot of venture capitalists out there. What are they going to go after? What opportunities does that leave for you as a social investor? Then, um, then, then you can think about, well, where will the ratio of social to private returns uh, tend to be high? OK, let me skip this slide. Um, um, let me just you know, s conclude on this topic and then conclude the talk. First uh, implication is we need to judge social innovation funds on a, on a portfolio basis. Let's not think about, hey, there was this anecdote of success or failure, or even this count. You know, the majority of projects didn't, didn't really scale that much. Because if you're a venture capitalist firm, so here's somewhere where I think you do need to think like a venture capitalist, you know that most of your investments are not going to be turn out to be Google or, or Amazon, but you, know, you invest in one Google or Amazon, that pays for a lot of other investments. Um, second implication is that I think there's a lot, of, at least this one case sort of ser serves as a proof of concept for the idea that open-tiered, uh, evidence-based social innovation funds can generate high social benefit cost ratios. And that raises the question of whether there's room for more. And France just set up a similar uh, fund, uh, which Esther Duflo is leading. But I think there's also potential in other areas, whether that's um, in environmental sustainability or ed tech or, or other areas. Okay. But let me, let me sort of come back uh, and conclude to the idea that development economics can be a tool for innovation. And here I don't just mean the experimental method, uh, other methods as well. But I think increasingly, throughout the, the social, throughout economics, I think more broadly in social science, but particularly in certain fields, including uh, development economics, but also some corners of economic theory, um, there's there's uh, there's increasing uh, role of researchers as innovators. So this is something that we would think is completely normal in biology or in computer science but has not traditionally been the way we think about uh, the role of economists. And I, th I think that this is, uh, this, is, you know, this is something that, at its best, uh, can be both something that produces a lot of useful things for the world, but also something that advances our scientific understanding. And there can be synergies. And I think we've seen that in other fields. And I think that could be true in economics as well. And you know, to return to the Development Innovation Lab, I think part of the idea of the Development Innovation Lab will be to try to support this process and to support it um, in ways that include things that are often difficult to do without the support that the university has provided. Um, things like building long-term sustained relationships with uh, practitioners, whether in governments, in nonprofit organizations, or in private firms to really work over time to test and, and iterate and refine ideas. Um, and I hope that through that process, we'll see you know, many more innovations succeed and advances in our understanding. So thank you.